Grace unto you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever had one of those moments where you witness something and then the devastating reality of what you've just seen, the reality that you cannot unsee that ever? Like it's burned into your retinas, it's imprinted on your memory, and you will live the rest of your life with that memory. Do you guys have some of those? I asked the, the congregation to share some stories at the service last night, and it got a little out of control, so I'm not going to do that this morning. <laughs> and we have a shorter time frame, so. You see, it was the year 2002. I had already peaked, because I peaked in high school, and it was a, you know, starting the descent, and I found myself in college. I don't know who decided that dormitories were a good idea. I really don't. But they kind of are a good idea. Put a bunch of young, you know, full of self-control and ambition young men together with very little supervision and no parental control. It's a great recipe for all kinds of memories. So I was just getting used to this. My friend Ryan, uh, from the great state of North Dakota, we didn't know each other, but we decided it was, a, it was a hot, muggy night. We were going to go take a shower before bed. So we're walking down the hallway to go take a shower. The cool thing about our dorms is that they were group showers. Some of you may be worried where this story is going. Don't be too worried. So we're walking down, and, and we turn the corner to walk into the bathroom. And we stopped. We'll call him Bill. All right, his name's Bill. Bill is standing in front of one of the sinks. And Bill's girlfriend is also in the boys' bathroom. Okay? Shaving his back. <laughs> like, I'm not kidding. And she wasn't using a razor. She was using a legit, like, like dog hair trimmer, okay? And she was having a hard time, okay? Like she had to put her arm into it, she was real, I mean, it looked like it was a lot of work. And, and you see, that's, a, that's an impressive thing to consider on a Sunday morning, just right there. But if I could help you visualize the pile of hair on the floor, for the rest of that semester, my friend Ryan and I, went to Bill's room and we sat at his feet because a man who knows the mysteries of women well enough to be two weeks into school, have a girlfriend and have her shaving his back is a rarity. Is a rarity. And, and as you know, then I got Diane to marry me, so he was a, a genius. All right, it worked. She didn't have hope, right? I will never unsee that. I will never unsee that moment, and now you can associate me with that moment, all right? There's things you can't unsee. It's just the way it works. I did not intend to witness that. I kind of wish I hadn't, but it's a good story. When you are made to be a witness, the, it's often outside of your control, and, and oftentimes maybe it's even against your will and against the hopes of, you know, different memories you want to carry with you. But, but being made to be a witness is something that happens. But then, without a request and not coming for our, from our own volition or will, we are now empowered to be a witness of those events. We've been doing eight words, and the last word we're going to talk about is the word witness. The Greek word is martus. Now, this word, this word has changed a little bit through history. I'm sure you've probably heard the, the English kind of changing up of this word, a martyr. Okay? So, we have used this word to make a martyr. So, if you die for a cause, you're a martyr. But specifically in Christendom, right, there's, there's been martyrs for the faith. There have been witnesses of the faith, and it's cost them their life. So this morning, we're going to dive into this idea. What does it mean to be a witness? What does it mean to 
have a witness and to do the witnessing. So the most relevant correlation of this word in like popular advertising is LeBron James. I know, you guys love LeBron James as much as I do. This is the banner that the city of Cleveland literally covered a building with. Okay? And I love the line. I love the line. We are all witnesses. The guy who did the marketing for Nike, he was hitting home runs. Because what a statement. He has just marketed LeBron James and Nike tennis shoes, right? To every single person who's ever watched LeBron play. Because it doesn't matter if you're rooting for him or against him, you have witnessed LeBron James. Now, of course, LeBron James want you to think, wants you to think about the greatness that you have witnessed. But it doesn't matter who you're rooting for, you have witnessed his skill. This is that whole idea that, that, that we are all witnesses of different things. And that we're not in control of it, and we can even witness things that we don't want to be happening. So let's go back to the Christian faith. Let's take this example. Jesus is getting ready to, to walk up to Jerusalem, and it is a climb, friends. You don't just like take the escalator up to Jerusalem. He has a long ways to go, and he has this big group of people with him. These people who are with Jesus during this journey are his actual disciples. They're, they're the 12 disciples, but then there's also the bigger group, a big group actually, that goes with him. And this group continues with him. In fact, later on in the story, we find that this blind man, who won't stop calling out to Jesus for him to have mercy, right, who just quite literally will not be quiet, then once he's healed, he continues to be noisy and to give glory to God. But this doesn't stop. This continues. So later, right before Easter, as we get to that story, and you hear about uh, Palm Sunday, and there's this huge celebration in Jerusalem as Jesus rides up into the city where he would die. This man is one of the people throwing down his cloak. This man is one of those who's singing Hosanna to the Lord in the highest. This is a member of that parade. And he has witnessed God's glory. So, Jesus is going up to Jerusalem. It's, this is the climax. This is what it's all about. He's going there for one reason. Because what happens in Jerusalem to Jesus will make the world his witness. But we need to understand this word a little bit more. And we need to understand one little switch. There's going to be one little switch here, but I think it makes a big difference. So oftentimes when we talk about witnessing to the Christian faith, right? There was the old style back in the 80s. Maybe this happened to you, right? The good Christians would walk up in their Sunday best, right? And they would knock on the doors of strangers. And then they would greet those strangers with a very warm statement. If you died tonight, do you know where you'd go? Because you might go to hell. Which is a great place to start when telling people about the love of Jesus. Right? Immediately you have new friends. But that idea has continued. And then in our minds, in our understanding of how do we witness the Christian faith, there's that pressure, there's that uncomfortableness where, where we, we're in this weird position where we want people to know the love of Jesus. But it's also like not many of us, myself included, feel comfortable telling other people what to believe. That's, that's an awkward situation, especially with strangers. And I actually don't recommend that. <laughs> So what is this word? 
And why does it feel weird for us, even those of us who know so deeply the power of God's grace? It begins with us looking to the witness in the wrong place. We have looked at ourselves as if we are the witness. But the chief witness is Jesus. The chief witness is Jesus. Witnessing to the Christian faith is not first and foremost about you, your witty slangs, or your ability to convict people they need a, a Lord and Savior. It's all about Jesus. You see, as we look up at the whole run-up to his arrival, the entirety of the Old Testament is laying out that there's going to be a very specific person who comes to witness. And that this person who's coming to witness to the world of the love of God has seen it all. And you have not seen it all. In fact, as the story builds over and over again, we see that this witness has, has seen even the very creation of the world. That this witness has known and held and understood the entire counsel of God's wisdom. That the number one witness has known God forever. That he knows every intention of the heart of God, and his name is Jesus. So we need to twist this around just a little bit, that, that when Jesus shows up, when Jesus comes to this world, he does not come with fire and brimstone. He does not come knocking on your door, demanding if you can face the fires of hell. Because we know that Jesus... In John 3, 16, made it very clear. For God so loved the world that, what did he do? He gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Then verse 17 is good too. It says, for the Son of Man did not come into the world to condemn the world. In other words, Jesus didn't show up to your door with the fires of hell in his pocket, ready to give you what you deserve. Instead, he showed up chiefly to witness to you, to share with you what he had seen and known for all eternity, and that is the love of God. That is his witness to you. He comes to you with a story, a story from the Son of God, from his very mouth, shared with a bunch of broken people the stories of their God. He comes to share with you the greatness he has seen. And friends, there is not one story, there is not one story in the entirety of the life of Jesus that we see in the story of Scripture where Jesus comes to broken, lost, confused, and hurting sinners and says, here, I have a little bit of the fires of hell for you. Instead, he tells them the story of a God who loves them beyond their wildest dreams. Every single time. And that is why there's two different kinds of witnessing. The first witness that Jesus gives is a witness that is entirely for you. It is the, it is the vertical witness. And I'm using that word in a kind of a weird way because we think of God as being above us, and that's good and right. So this witness, the first use, and it's where witnessing starts, is a vertical witness between you and your heart and your knowledge of your own history and God Almighty. Because this is where it has to start. I'm sure all of you have very good friends. I'm sure you have friends you have cried with, friends you have celebrated with, friends you have hurt with, friends you have lost and sat in silence with. Because sometimes friendships don't need words. 
in the worst moments and in the best moments. But we have in ourselves, don't we, that, that little bit in the proverbial pit of our stomach that we just keep to ourselves. A little bit there in the shadow of our heart. That little bit of, of darkness that, that we, we had that little fear in the back of our head that we would love to get it off our chest. We'd love to share it with some of our best friends. We'd love, we'd love to have someone bear that burden with us. But deep down in our heart, there's that question that keeps us from sharing that darkness that's way deep in the bottom. Because we just can't lose them. We can't bear the possibility that darkness is too dark and they leave us alone. I have that. The witness of Jesus. The witness of Jesus to the glory and the love of our Heavenly Father starts right there. Where Jesus tells you that he has something. Something so good, something so pure, something so eternal and strong and relentless that the love of God is what we need. And so when Jesus brings his witness to us, to our hearts, he goes straight to that place. Because he knows we have people for everything else. Right? He knows we have things for people for the days we're doing well things and people for the, you know, for the normal tough days. But Jesus came for the darkest of the dark and he came to bring light even there. So the witness of Jesus, the story that Jesus would tell to you is a story where there is no darkness for you. And his witness and his story is for that shadow place inside of you. Because then he knows. Then he knows that the love of God has made you a witness. A witness of his mercy and his grace. And then he knows that, that people who have, who have had the witness there, in the very center, the very core of who they are, when they've received the stories of Jesus, the works of God in that pit of their stomach, that then it will cover the rest of them. And then when you start doing that with groups of people, you get this, a witness community. And that's what you are. You're a witness community. Sometimes the world thinks that Christians come together in a church on Sunday because they're scared to hell. And, and they're wrong. Christians come together on Sundays, they, they actually open their Bibles, they consider the depth of the cross and God's love, not because they're scared of anything, but because they have hope. Because beyond their wildest hopes, somebody has dared to give them love where they thought they were unlovable. Where they thought they didn't deserve it. A place where they were hoping nobody would ever find out about. And then those people who know hope, even there, they come together. They come together. You're here not because of your best days. You're here because Jesus has joined you on your worst. And we like that. We love that. And we are witnesses of that. Now the book of Revelation has some pretty wild stories. And they're really given to just help you visualize in, in, a, in a really different way this story of God's grace. But here in Revelation chapter 12, I believe, is one of the cool spots, right? So there's this dragon. It's not real. Don't worry. Uh, but kind of real. That's a different sermon. Uh, so there's a... There's a giant dragon trying to kill off Christians, right? But they, the Christians, they have conquered this dragon, and they've done it by the blood of the Lamb. Now that's shorthand in the Bible to say by the cross of Jesus, right? By the power of Easter, they have conquered. But the second part is as important. And, and they've conquered the enemy of the church by the word of of their testimony by their witness. 
So the church, friends, the group of believers that have existed for thousands of years, has existed for thousands of years because Jesus has protected it, but also because they have witnessed Jesus. You see, the protection of the church is the protection of your hope. The reason the Christian church has continued and continued and continued despite all the adversity is because God has not woven fear into your heart, but that he has taken all of it away. Just like he did for Jameson. All fear is gone. Friends, this is what the witness is. This is the witness that has tied us together in the Lord's house. This is the strength of the church. This witness is what's going to guarantee the future of St. John's, the guarantee the future of every single Christian church in the United States, in Singapore, and even in Italy. It is this witness, it is this hope. Because we have seen the mysteries of God. And the mysteries of God tell the story of a God whose love is so deep and so good, so pure and unstoppable, that he loves you in your entirety. May this love, may the witness of Jesus, may it strengthen your hope. May it drive your hope and feed your hope, and may that hope dwell strong within you by his grace. We pray.